Did you hear about the time that Homer Simpson broke maths and set all the mathematicians scrambling? Our favourite duff drinking dad may not usually be known for his mathematical prowess, but the writers of The Simpsons certainly are, with enough PhDs between them to change all of our light bulbs remotely. And when you put a bunch of mathematicians and physicists in a writer's room, they might write, mmm, donut, but they're definitely thinking, mmm, Taurus, and looking for ways to sneak in their favourite theorems and equations into the script. You might have noticed the pie jokes or Maggie's building block spelling E equals MC squared, but no one would blame you if you missed this little piece of genius. To appreciate it fully, we're going to need to whip out our Pythagoras theorem. Now you can't complain you haven't used it since high school. So Pythagoras Pythagoras theorem says that for any right angle triangle with sides of length a, b and c, that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. We're not going to prove it, we'll just take Pythag's word for it, but here's an example. This is a right angle triangle with sides of length 3, 4 and 5. And lo and behold, 3 squared plus 4 squared does equal 5 squared, because 9 plus 16 equals 25. Now, this little trio of numbers, 3, 4 and 5, is called a Pythagorean triple. We can find infinite trios of whole numbers that work in this equation. If you fancy a little challenge, find another 3. But this wasn't enough of a challenge for French lawyer and amateur mathematician Pierre de Fermat. Buff, he said, élémentaire, mon cher Watson. He wanted to find whole numbers that would work in the equation a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed, and not just trivial solutions where you cheat by using a zero, proper bigger than zero solutions. If you fancy a little challenge, stay well away from this problem. This is no little challenge, as Fermat soon discovered. He couldn't find any feet to fit these cube-shaped slippers. He then tried it to the power of four, to no avail. He tried it to the power of five, nothing. Higher and higher powers he climbed, but his search was equally fruitless, until finally he concluded that there are no numbers which satisfy any of these equations. Now, I know what you're thinking, he can't have checked all the numbers. No, but he did find a proof that no such numbers existed. Or at least he said he did. In the margin of a maths book, he scribbled, I have found a truly marvellous proof of this, which this margin is too narrow to contain. And then he died. Not immediately, like 30 years later, but apparently not long enough later to have found a bigger piece of paper to elaborate on said proof. This may be the single most frustrating thing done by any individual in the history of mathematics, apart from the one that decided to put bod mass riddles on the internet. But Fermat did find the time to make all sorts of other insightful observations and claims of theorems in the margins, but when it came to the proofs of those theorems, no space, no time. Then his son, determined not to be outdone by his father, embarked upon the second most frustrating thing done by any individual in the history of mathematics. He published the book, complete with his father's margin notes, when his father was no longer around to be questioned on them. But the mathematicians got to work, and before long they'd proven all of Fermat's claims. But one. Fermat's last theorem, they called it, the last one that remained unsolved. For over 300 years, no one found any numbers that worked in the equation, but no one could prove there weren't any either. Cash money was offered, glory awaited, but still Fermat's truly marvellous proof resisted discovery. People started to believe he was a bit of a blagger, until at last in 1995, English mathematician Andrew Wiles cracked it. He published a proof. There are indeed no numbers that satisfy the equation a to the power of n plus b to the power of n equals c to the power of n for powers greater than 2. Just one slight snag. In the third most frustrating thing done by any individual in the history of maths, it relied upon techniques that wouldn't have been available to Fermat, so it couldn't have been Fermat's proof. But it was a proof nonetheless. The maths world could relax. Until season 10, episode 2 of The Simpsons, The Wizard of Evergreen Terrace. While Homer is trying to follow in the footsteps of Thomas Edison by coming up with an invention that will make his life worthwhile, eagle-eyed viewers may spot that he's scribbled some equations on a chortboard. One of them being 3987 to the power of 12 plus 4365 to the power of 12 equals 4472 to the power of 12. It couldn't be. Could it? A trio of numbers that satisfies the equation that Fermat and Wiles said was impossible? Well, let's do what every mathematician watching that episode did. Grab a calculator. We'll type 3987 to the power of 12 plus 4365 to the power of 12 equals. Now we'll take the 12th root of that and I caramba if it's not 4472. But before you go DMing Andrew Wiles, we have access to one thing that most of the viewers in 1998 didn't. 
a more accurate calculator. If we just turn it sideways, we'll see that the actual answer is 4472.0000000007. It's close, but not close enough to topple an entire field of mathematics. In a bout of extraordinary dedication to a joke, Simpsons writer David X. Cohen had written a whole computer program with the aim of finding near misses, numbers that came as close as possible to balancing the equation, that would fool an everyday calculator into thinking that Fermat's last theorem had been disproven, all for one line on a chalkboard that most of us missed. But inspired by his dedication, I decided to have a go at proving for Maslow's theorem myself, not with any of Andrew Wiles' fancy new maths, the OG way that Fermat would have intended. And I think I've got something. Suppose that we can find three numbers that... Oh. <sighs> Shh. 